what is uh, an eclipse? So, um, so eclipse is when the moon comes between the earth and the sun and the shadow of the sun is cast onto the surface of the earth. And so in this, in this drawing, uh, in this drawing, trying to see if I can get my, uh, where's my, there's the extended screen it's showing on my computer, but where is it? Oh, my mouse is not uh, getting onto the zoom. Okay, that's life. Uh, so I guess I have to use this mouse. Does that work? Kind of, yeah. Uh, zoom messes everything up. So this is the passage of the uh, sun, the eclipse across our planet during uh, April 8th, 2024, and uh, the uh, and uh, showing at different time intervals the location of the shadow of the moon as it moves across the Earth. This is a you know 26 year old satellite uh, loop of the shadow of the earth, of the shadow of the moon running across the earth as seen from space. And so it's a hundred mile wide shadow, you know, as if there's a big cloud, you know, cloud thousands of miles across, casting a dark shadow on the surface of the earth. You know, this is quite sped up. So it, uh, the, the shadow does move at twice the speed of sound. This is showing what would normally take an hour and a half in uh, two seconds because you know modern audiences get bored uh, if we try to show the whole thing. Um, and then here's a nice little computer animation. Again, this is from 2017. Again, vastly sped up, showing kind of uh, a perspective, a bird's eye view if you were standing just behind the moon between the moon and the sun as the shadow of the, of the moon moves from uh, west to east across the surface of the earth. And I don't know what that kickoff in Schiffman, I mean, what am I supposed to do with that? Uh, uh, it's not even on my screen here. I've, okay. Uh, it's not on this, my computer screen, it's... Okay, uh, Zoom is really annoying. You would think after all the pandemic. So now what? Okay, I did Zoom and... Uh, yeah, but it's not on my computer screen. It's, it's hidden behind something else, but not nowhere on my screen. Uh, It's not on my screen, but it's on somebody else's screen. Just like sharing your screen? Uh, yes, I mean, because there it is, right? Yeah. Annoying. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's floating, but it's not. <laughs> well, I mean, it's got that ugly, annoying thing oh, there. Okay. Oh, you have an extra mouse. Okay. Control and install. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. That's good. That is excellent. Is there anything pops up? It's quite good. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank. Everything pops up. I use the other mouse. Got it. Thank you. Um, and uh, so this uh website eyes.nasa.gov has this wonderful simulator that lets you see when the celestial spheres align. So let me see 
if I leave and I come into this, uh, oh God, see. Okay, so now it's not showing on my screen, so I have to do a stop share. Is that what I have to do? Zoom. Uh, I don't want to quit Zoom because that will probably, where's Matt? Did he disappear again? I'm trying to get out of Zoom. Oh, let's see. Because I'm in another thing. Oh, stop share. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then share, share screen. screen. I share everything because nothing works anyway. Okay, so in um, uh, so if you go to this nice simulator, then you can uh, rotate the Earth and you can move back out into space. And so then here's the orbit of the of the uh, moon of the of the moon around the Earth, and then if you just keep zooming out, then you see this blue, this dim blue line is the uh, ecliptic plane, and there's there's the sun, and you can kind of line it up with the Earth, and then you can zoom in, you know, and so we're way. You know, we're zooming in. Here's the sun. Whoops. Okay. There's the sun lined up with the Earth. I just zoomed right through the surface of the. We just tunneled through the sun, and now we're zooming in, coming in to Earth, and we see that white line. This this white line here is the tilt is the orbital plane of the moon, and we just keep zooming in and zooming in, and then now we see the moon, and we see the shadow of the moon cast down onto the surface of the Earth. And if we keep zooming in and zooming in, then at this moment in time, the shadow is missing the surface of the Earth. This is on April 8th, 2024, a few minutes before totality. So if I speed up to, let's say, five minutes per second, so I'm going like, you know, 500 times faster than real time, then we start seeing the shadow of the earth, of the, of the moon now hitting the surface of the earth, you know, and it's first going to have landfall in Mazatlan, Mexico, you know, and then it makes its way uh, into Texas, here at Dallas, Arkansas, Indianapolis, up to the Northeast, Buffalo, Montreal, you know, and then it falls off the surface of the earth somewhere in the Arctic. So that's uh, this wonderful little simulation uh, courtesy of uh, NASA. And then now I want to go back to PowerPoint. There it is. And Okay, so um, uh, yeah, my first solar eclipse was in uh, 1979. Uh, I was an undergraduate in uh, a physics major at Berkeley, California, and the eclipse was coming across Oregon. Uh, it was gonna come on land in Portland, Oregon in April, the same vernal eclipse as, as now. And I was working in the astrophysics group at Berkeley, headed by a Nobel Prize laureate, Louis Alvarez. And uh, Louis was going to fly along the path of totality with a bunch of rich friends, as befits a uh, Nobel Prize laureate. And uh, he said, you know, that way he's going to be above the clouds. He's going to see the thing, you know. And I was very disappointed not to be invited as an undergraduate with Nobel Prize laureate, but also that I would, you know, you know, Oregon, it's cloudy. I, I might miss the eclipse. And, you know, I had planned to go with a couple of my buddies, two physicists, 
to uh, art majors in our VW camper, you know, to drive up and, and uh, you know, drive along the path till we found some clear skies. And he said, you know, you're going to have a much better experience than being encased in a sterile aluminum can above the earth. You're going to be able to, you know, experience uh, things much better, you know, than I am. Don't, don't worry. It's going to be awesome. And, you know, he had a Nobel Prize, very smart guy. He was correct. So we get up there and, you know, uh, uh, we're driving in the VW van. My buddy is, um, is driving. You know, I have my head out the window looking up. You know, it's just cloudy, cloudy, cloudy. And we head to the rain shadow of Mount Baker. You know, all the bad Pacific uh, weather, all the bad weather in Oregon is coming from the Pacific. So if you get on the east side of the volcanoes, then the rain falls on the west side. It's drier. You know, we're driving along. Uh, there's cars scurrying around, you know, everybody's looking up. And finally, you know, it's an hour before totality. We park the car, just dump it on the side of the road. There's a, you know, a thousand foot tall mountain in the foothills. We go scramble up to the top of it. My physics buddy sets up his tripod with a time-lapse camera. Now in those days, you couldn't afford to buy a time-lapse cam camera. So he made it out of electronics, JK flip-flops. You don't even know what I'm talking about like super ancient technology from the 70s. You know, it was all proud. He set it up and um, totality is approaching. 10 minutes before totality, the temperature in the air drops. It's becoming chilly. You know, we had, we had scrambled up the mountain quickly. We we're sweating, but now it's getting, you know, freezing cold. The birds go silent and start to roost. And the... Um, and you know we're looking up at where the sun should be, but you know, there's clouds, and bit by bit the clouds start to evaporate. First slowly, and then uh, with increasing speed until just the one minute before totality, they vanish miraculously, completely. And for some reason, uh, I don't know why, you know we were looking to the east where the morning sun was. I turn around and look over my shoulder to the west. And there in the distance is this dark looming shadow. It's, it's like a shadow cast from the, from the clouds. Uh, uh, but this is a cloud that extends all the ways to the northern horizon, all the ways to the southern horizon, from the ground to the heavens. And this shadow, as you watch for a few seconds, is getting darker and darker. It's hurtling at you at three times the speed of sound, just this wall of darkness that, you know, in a, just a few short seconds envelops you in darkness. And then you turn around and you look up at the sun and now you see the corona and the stars uh, coming uh, behind you. And it's just as if God took the sky and just lifted it up and peeled it back, you know, uh, peeled back the firmaments revealing the darkness on the, on the other side. And um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, we were cut off guard by this unexpected and terrifying occurrence. And of course, my buddy forgot to turn on the time lapse on his camera, you know, which we only discovered, you know, after this, you know, the, the thing had passed. But it didn't matter, the, the memory, the vivid memory, uh, even after 45 uh, years remains vivid on our minds. Uh, uh, so don't bother with cameras. Uh, so this kind of, um, this kind of experience of looking at the shadow, you would think uh, you would find many examples in the literature but I search and search and I find next to no mention of it. And uh, okay, now my mouse is working. Oh, I'm so happy. And so it says in this one, this is like the only one I found in all my searches of the internet. Noted painter uh, described the shadow's appearance, you know, in June, 1918. And, uh, you know, and so, 
you know, for an instant, the valley retained its green color and then the shadows seemed to rush towards us and all was engulfed. And it just kind of reminds me of this drawing of, uh, of you know, some appearing through the fir firmament and looking on the other side. And so, um, uh, um, okay, why is there a moon? Where does the moon come from? So here's, you know, here's the story, the creation story of the moon. There's some thing called L4, a big hunk of dirt, <laughs> and it smashes into the earth and then kicks off the moon. That's, that's, that's the moon. And then, uh, then that's a cartoon rendition of the moon. Here's a fancy, uh, uh, you know, supercomputer, military, full simulation. You know, this is like you get in a, in a, in like the Doom movie or something, you know, a hundred million dollars for a physicist to play uh, with the creation of the universe. So uh, that blob there, that's gonna get a little circle around it, that's the moon. And the other blob gets absorbed into the planet. You know, this is four and a half million years ago. You can imagine not much life survived this uh, cataclysmic uh, event, and the uh, you know all the momentum and angular momentum. You know, anyway, we're left with our moon. So that's why we have eclipses because four and a half million years ago, some massive <laughs> catastrophe befell our planet. Um, so uh, you got the sun, and the sun is okay the sun uh, is aligned with the moon and then it casts a shadow on the earth and now today is uh march 25th and tonight is a full moon and the full moon is going to align with the shadow of the earth. And so we're going to have a lunar eclipse tonight at uh, you know, 3 a.m. in Eastern Standard Time. You, you slept through it. Uh, you slept through it, but it was cloudy. You didn't miss anything. My colleague says you were in the penumbra not even the umbra who cares about penumbras uh it's uh it's anticlimactic and two weeks later because it takes one month four weeks for the moon to orbit the earth two weeks later april 8th will be a new moon and then we will see a eclipse of the sun and um uh yeah, this was an animation of the eclipse, but it happened already. You missed it. I'm not going to show you the animation. Um, and so, in the in the in the in the total eclipse of the sun, which is going to be on April eighth, then there's these two uh, Latin words, umbra, where it's completely dark, and penumbra where it's partially obscured. At Brandeis, it's going to be 93% obscure. You're going to be in this penumbra, this, this outer zone where only the moon doesn't block the full sun. And so if you look at the path of totality, uh, here's the, it's just this narrow strip 100 miles wide. And then if you observe the, moon, the sun, from Earth at these different locations within the penumbra, then in the path of totality, you'll see the corona. If you're just outside, like we are at Brandeis, you'll see 93% of the sun bitten off by the moon, and there'll just be this little crescent sun left. And as you are farther away from the path of totality, the maximum amount of obscuration of the sun by the moon diminishes until at the edge of the penumbra here at F, then they're just tangent to each other and there's no occlusion. Okay, so uh, why do we have a solar eclipse every month? Um, 
So the moon is going, uh, uh, why don't we have a solar eclipse every month? So the moon is going around the earth, but the plane of the moon is tilted. The orbital plane is tilted and sometimes the shadow is too high and sometimes the shadow is too low. And then sometimes like in the fable of Goldilocks, it's just right and everything aligns. And so can I have a volunteer to be the sun and a volunteer to be the earth? Here's, here's our sun. Uh, a sun of course is a uh, sun. Could you gather here? I'll volunteer to be the moon. Uh, sun, uh, can you hold up the sun? Okay, it's orange, it's orange, the sun is orange. Moon is white. And then uh, this is earth. And this uh, represents the orbital plane. Uh, of the of the moon and it's tilted. Pardon. Anahita wants us to. You have to scoot over. Our director of education and outreach says, uh, "Scoot." So you have to scoot. When she says scoot, you ask how high. <laughs> um, and so when the Earth is tilted and the lunar plane is tilted, as uh, Thomas is holding right here. The, the northern hemisphere is pointing towards the sun. This is summer. This is the summer solstice. And so at this moment, the moon uh, would have the shadow uh, from the sun, but it would be too low. It would be too low and no eclipse. And then come around to winter, please. So half a year later, so the sun is orbiting, the earth is orbiting the sun. It went 180 degrees, half a year later. Now the tilt, the North Pole is away from the sun, it's darkness. But, and now when the moon is in between the sun and, uh, and uh, Earth, the shadow is too high, it's too high. No eclipse, everybody's very sad. We bought all these glasses, took photographs, no eclipse. But in spring, in springtime, then the, uh, the tilt, of the Earth's axis is perpendicular to the orbit. And at this moment, the, all of the Earth gets 12 hours of light. It doesn't matter if you're on the North Pole. It doesn't matter if you're on the equator. It doesn't matter if you're in Boston, if you're in Barcelona. It doesn't matter if you're in Ecuador. Everywhere on the planet on March 20th, 2024, I got 12 hours of day and light. And now if the moon is in its orbit between the sun and the earth, the nodal lines align. And now the three objects align and the shadow is projected onto the surface of the earth. So April 8th, we will get an, a, a solar eclipse. And two weeks earlier this morning at 3 a.m. when it was full moon because this is the dark side of the earth. And then the sun projects onto the moon and it's a full moon. If you go out tonight on the full moon, you would be in the shadow of the earth and it's a lunar eclipse. So thank you, earth. Thank you, a round of applause for the sun and the earth. So twice a year, the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox it's possible to have eclipses, but the stupid orbit of the moon is elliptical. Sometimes it's too uh, far away and it doesn't work. So it's more like one out of three uh, times you get it, okay? So you don't get it twice a year. You get it about once every year and a half. And 2024 is gonna be an awesome eclipse as eclipses go. They're all kind of, well, some are more awesomer than others. Okay. So that's why we don't have a solar eclipse every month. We usually have them twice. We can have them twice a year, but uh, we don't. And so we're just here at this vernal equinox that's uh, eclipse season. And so from the perspective of the sun, here we are at the winter equinox and the new moon is projecting too high. And then here in from the perspective of the sun, we're at the 
uh, vernal equinox, I mean, winter solstice, vernal equinox here. And then we can have, uh, in this case, when the moon is between the sun and the earth, uh, we have a solar eclipse. And then over here, two weeks earlier, we have a lunar eclipse when the moon is in the shadow of the earth. Okay. And then, you know, here's a perspective from if we're on the earth, then you see the sun go around the earth. And during the full year, the sun goes higher and lower. And the moon during a month goes higher and lower. And twice a year, the path of the moon and the path of the sun uh, uh, hit together. So if you're, uh, so uh, you can look at it from either way, from sitting on the sun or sitting on the earth. Um, so the total uh, eclipse, whoops, the total eclipse of the sun is a accident. The accident is that, um, is that the, the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but it's exactly 400 times farther away from the sun, closer to us, to the sun than the sun. And so the angular uh, angle, the, the, the amount of it that it obscures is identical. If the moon was just a little bit farther away, uh, we would not uh, get an eclipse. And due to the tidal forces of the moon on the earth, uh, angular momentum is being transferred from the earth to the moon and the moon's orbit is getting bigger, two inches a year. And in just a billion years, we'll no longer see an eclipse. So time is fleeting. Don't waste any moment. Life is short. You only have a billion years to experience an eclipse. On April 8th, go spend a few hours, travel north to see the full eclipse of the sun. If you're an undergraduate, you think, oh, I have a lecture I have to go to. The lecture is unimportant compared to the total eclipse of the sun. You're a graduate student. Oh, I'm going to lose five hours driving. You're spending five years on your thesis. Five hours isn't going to matter. Uh, so just, you know, they're finite. You're lucky to be alive during this billion year period. Don't lose that opportunity. Go see the Go see the eclipse. Um, okay, I said that you get them about every uh, six months. So when's the next one? Because after you've seen one, that's the only question you ask, when's the next one? And uh, so here we are, uh, April uh, 8th, 2024. The blue ones are total and the red are ones that are too, you know, too far away. So you don't get a total eclipse, just partial eclipse, annular eclipse. So you see they're twice a year, but only uh, one out of three are total. There's gonna be a, a, a pretty nice one. There's none in 2025. 2026, you have one going through the Straits of Gibraltar. That one looks quite nice. Uh, 2027, um, I don't know, where is it? Down here, Australia. You know, 20, you know, whatever. There, uh, no, it's 2026 is this one going over Greenland and then Spain. 2027 is Straits of Gibraltar. 2028 is uh, uh, Australia. And um, so here's the 2026 one. It's uh, scooting down over Greenland and then it's gonna, it's gonna terminate uh, in, uh, Spain here. And in Spain, it's going to be going the shadow because it's coming obliquely. It's going to be going 9,000 miles an hour. You know, so that's just kind of insane. I don't, you know, you got to go see that. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. In 2027, this is the one I'm very excited about. Do you see this path of totality goes right through the Straits of Gibraltar, half on Morocco, half in Spain. Uh, I think if you can get there on the African side, looking both ways, 
this is, you know, or in like the Atlas Mountains here in uh, Algeria, this one's going to be amazing. Uh, and then 2028, you know, who doesn't love koala bears and kangaroos? It's, you know, I'm sure I've never been to Australia, got to go 2028. Um, and then when's it coming back to the US? Everybody's asking, oh, I, let's say I really need to go to that lecture on classical mechanics, you know, instead of seeing the most amazing celestial event, you know, in the creation of the universe, I need to hear this lecture on Lagrangians, you know. Uh, when's it coming back to the US, you say, because I can't miss this lecture. Um, Alparna is a great instructor. You, nobody's going to cut her class, right? Uh, so 2045, you know, 21 years. Okay, so you have to, everybody has to do that calculus. You know, do I go to a partner's lecture or do I wait 21 years? You know, that's, that's up to you. Um, then uh, you want to know, where should I go? So, of course, you turn to Bloomberg and Bloomberg has, uh, you know, Bloomberg says, uh, where should you go? Okay. Well, you could go to Texas, let's say the Ground Zero Music Festival, uh, 20 bands, a full cowboy rodeo, stunt shows, a car and truck show. Okay. So, you know, it doesn't get better than that, right? I mean, you know, why would you even look at the eclipse if you had, the, you know, so you have Oklahoma, Arkansas, you have lots of suggestions for the uh, best place to go. Then you ask, what about the weather? So, you know, these eclipse people, they take all the NASA satellite imagery from April 8th for the last 10 years. You know, they look at the cloud coverage and then they make, you know, a probability distribution. So here's April 8th, 2023. You can see uh, where I'm going. Uh, uh, you can see where I'm going, which is right here. Uh, and the brown signifies no clouds. And then you can see Boston right here. You know, the, here's the path kind of kind of goes through Texas. It's like uh, Indiana goes through, you know, well, this is the path. And, uh, and there's Brandeis University. So, you know, it's not so bad. If we are, if you're as lucky on April 8th, uh, 2023, uh, then, you know, you're going to have an awesome time in Vermont and uh, northern New Hampshire. So, uh, you know, knock on wood. Um, the, the, the two websites I use most heavily for planning eclipses, one is this one, Jupier, this French guy that uh, has planning and this other one, uh, Eclipsophile for weather. You know, these, these are two, you know, super, uh, this one for weather is just amazing. Uh, this guy is obsessed. So then he has, I don't know, tens and tens of pages, the most detailed analysis, takes into account El Nino, everything. It's just wonderful. But, but that's for a year in advance planning, you know, uh, stuff that people, crazy people like me do. For you people who waited to the last minute, then this, is, what he recommends is this website, Spot Weather, spotwx.com. This is an awesome website. So you go to spotwx.com. Here you go, you put in your um, spot. So here I picked uh, White Face Mountain which I'll go into some detail about why I picked that as a spot pot for you. Then you have all these uh, fancy forecast models. I took the, I did this this morning. I took the 10 day forecast from the, uh, from the government and then it gives you these plots, you know? So this is the 10 day forecast. Here's cloud coverage. It goes up to April 4th, uh, you know, it gives clouds, snow, rain, you know, everything you want. So you know, these forecasts get more and more accurate the closer you get. So if you're going to be driving, you're figuring out where you're going to drive, 
you know, it's okay to drive 10 hours. You know, it's really not a big deal. Uh, so you look at these things, you know, 12, 12 hours in advance, you know, you want to sleep a little, 18 hours in advance, you know, and then you make your decision. So this is a great site. You have to drive to Buffalo, you have to drive to Indianapolis. It doesn't matter, you know, it's just, you know, it's just, you get three people in a car, you do shifts, it's going to be fine. Uh, so for short-term uh, forecasts, that's pretty good. I like this website for you know longer term planning, like where you're going to go, and um, it gives you you know this interactive map, and then you zoom in, and uh, you know from the weather forecast, I pick oh I want to go to Mazatlan, and then you click, and it it draws you uh, this cool little circle. So this shows you the hundred mile circle of totality. And it gives you like information, like the maximum eclipse is at this moment in universal time, 1810, you know, universal time tells you the speed, 1,561 1, miles per hour. It tells you the angle of the sun, the azimuthal, the altitude, so you can know where the shadow's coming from and where the sun is to get the best perspectives. So I, I use this site uh, quite heavily. Uh, uh, for uh, eclipse planning. Um, and now, uh, let's see, close that. Back to PowerPoint. Um, and then, okay, but why did I pick Sinaloa? So if you go to this weather website, you know, from the Eclipsophile, and then you plot the probability of cloud coverage on April 8th, you know, from these NASA photographs for the last 10 years, this is the plot. So, uh, you know, here's Mazatlan, you know, where I'm going, you know, it's at like 25%. Here's, uh, here's, you know, where you are, you know, 70%. So 70% chance of cloud coverage, you know, 25%. This is good for long-term planning. One, one or two days in advance, none of this matters. What matters is what's gonna, you know, weather is highly variable. So you look at that spot WX, you know, I use this, you know, cause I'm gonna put myself where there's the highest probability, but I'm still gonna, I have a car, I'm still gonna drive, you know, maybe, uh, you know, hundred or 200 miles if I, depending on the forecast a day in advance, you know, you, you but I, you know, I'm not gonna, Anyway, okay, so um, I'm not going to cancel the trip to Mexico and come to Vermont if the weather's better in Vermont. You know, you know, I, like a year in advance, I use this, but a couple of days in advance, I use those short term weather things. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, so this is the region, Mexico, where I'm going. And, uh, and so here's a photograph of my group on Men and Buttes, uh, Jim Haber was, there's, there, this was 2017 Idaho. And uh, there's two volcanoes right next to each other that had the greatest view. I was on one, Jim was on the other. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I don't know if you can see, but you know, this is me and I'm pointing away from the sun because, because you know, Looking west, there is just fantastic stuff happening. The corona is awesome, but there's fantastic stuff help, happening elsewhere. And so in this particular moment, we were in Idaho about 60 miles from the Grand Tetons. The Grand Tetons are 14,000 foot mountains. We were on a few thousand foot tall uh, volcano and there were forest fires burning in the west. And, the, and during the day, when the sun was still out, you could not see 50 miles. You could not see the Tetons. They were obscured by the smoke. But then just uh, at, as the shadow of the earth, of the moon swept across the earth and it almost hit the Tetons, then what that shadow did is it prevented the sunlight from scattering off the dust particles, but it was still illuminating the um, the mountains. And so it was just as if God took a curtain and lifted it up above a stage and there was this backdrop 
of these beautiful golden mountains. And this lasted for 15 seconds, you know, and then God lowered the curtain and they were gone. And all around you, as you were looking, every 15 seconds, the colors would shift. Another feature in the landscape would appear and disappear. Another atmosphere effect, completely unpredictable. Every eclipse is different. The angle of lights are different. You don't know, but don't just look up at the corona as awesome as that is. Look at the corona for a few seconds, 10 seconds, and then lower your sights, look at the horizon, spend 20 seconds sweeping the horizon, then go up and look at the corona. Corona changes you know, slowly, so you're not gonna miss anything in that 20 seconds and just keep looking around. So, uh, and then uh, of course, photographs just don't capture anything, but your imagination, you know, the poetry, the artistry uh, does. And so this is a painting that one of the Brandeis undergraduates who came with us to, uh, and here's several other Brandeis students who came with us to Idaho in 2017. Uh, Remy uh, painted this uh, uh, and gave it to me as a remembrance of that 10 seconds when the Tetons were <laughs> revealed. Um, uh, and uh, so then here's a description of an artist who saw something similar in 1918. Um, okay, photography, you want to try to capture this. So one of the best things I saw in the, I don't take photographs during the eclipse, I'm just looking, but you know, I have friends who are photographers who are coming and they take great photographs, you know, so if you're a skilled photographer, yes, take photographs, but uh, I, I personally don't. But I saw this one, uh, I saw this one YouTube, afterwards, which I thought was pretty awesome. So this is one of these uh, uh, 4K 360 cameras, you know, where you can look uh, in all directions simultaneously. You know, there's the Grand Tetons, they're on top of in a ski resort right near the Grand Tetons, you know, and they're looking out, you know, here's the, the approaching shadows coming from this direction. And then uh, with the audio, you hear all these like people are going crazy. And so, uh, you know, the shadows, you know, there's darkness is approaching. And then, you know, then there's, you know, now you're in, you know, totality, everybody's freaking out. And then, you know, whatever. So I find that this kind of captures it in some sense, this, this kind of 360 thing. So, um, uh, so I think those cameras maybe have a role in, uh, in, the, in the photography. Uh, uh, and so being the kind of crazy person that I am, I bought one, 400 bucks. You know, I set it up on my porch uh, this morning, took some pictures and, you know, whatever. So uh, this is the version of like the time lapse that my Brent set up, I'm gonna to try to remember to turn it on like 10 minutes before the eclipse and then just forget about it. And I bought a, a SIM card that lasts an hour, you know, so uh, I'm just gonna set it up somewhere. Maybe I'll remember to turn it on, maybe not, I don't know. Anyway, so that's kind of what I recommend is a 360 camera. Um, okay, and then just uh, how does one use Google Earth to find the best place to view the eclipse. Uh, and you might need this in the next couple of days. So you go to Google Earth and maybe you go to Google Earth, maybe not. Uh, hmm, that's not good. Okay, yeah, here's Google Earth. And, you know, I've made some, you know, locations along the path of totality. Uh, you know, and the places I'm going. And then, so like, if I go to Mazatlan, you zoom in to Mazatlan. And then with Google Earth, you can do this thing, like where you go to 3D, you know, and then it kind of rotates and you click and shift, and then you can do a sighting. So for example, what I do is I wanna find the longest line of sight along the path of totality to the west. So I'm looking towards mountain ranges. 
and I want to find what is the longest path of, of without any uh, uh, interruption. So if I pick this spot here and I zoom in on it, And, you know, and if I rotate around, the thing is not very responsive. All right, I don't know. Zoom. So, and I go back to like Mazatlan. Okay, so like I'm gonna be like here you know, I zoom in and I say, okay, I want to look here. You know, then you can, you know, you can zoom in and you can determine that you have uninterrupted uh, sight lines. So for you, you who aren't going to uh, Mexico with me, then I picked Whiteface Mountain as a, a good local alternative. So then if I go to uh, the 3D, you know, so here's Whiteface Mountain. This is where the uh, Winter Olympics were in, I think, 1960, Lake Placid. And so then if you uh, zoom out and you look along the path of totality towards Buffalo, Oh, there's Boston. You want to go out, out this way towards, yeah, there's Buffalo, there's Watertown. And so then, so if you get up on this mountain and you look, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Don't ask me why it was so. Anyway, so this is the um, this is the view from you come to here. Yeah. And then, so the view from White Face Mountain looks uh, to me pretty good. And that's, that's looking east to Jay Peak, another ski resort that's in Vermont. That's an excellent place. And then if you spin around and look west towards the approaching um, where the shadow comes from, there it is. And you zoom in, then you have a, you have a, yeah, you have a good view uh, west. So then, so I think those are excellent choices and you can, you know, use Google Earth to uh, create effect to kind of um, find uh, promising locations for which you can then plan your trip. So a year ago, I did that for going to Mexico. I used Google Earth and I picked like this spot here, uh, Mirador Buenos Aires. And then, you know, I scrambled up there, bushwhacking everything. And I was rewarded with this view of about 60 miles from the Sierra Madre Occidental out to the Pacific Ocean and along the path of totality. You know, and so this would be, you know, one of the better places in the world to view the eclipse. And then this was another place that I picked from Google Earth. And this is a little platform that uh, people built to observe the sun. And I'm just spinning around 360 degrees. This is looking along the receding path of totality. That mountain is where we're going to climb to view it. And then now we're looking to the west where you see the Pacific Ocean and Mazatlan, where the shadow will come. And uh, this is the spot uh, that I picked for 
viewing the eclipse, you know, that I identified on Google Earth. And then this is the house that I'm renting or I have rented. And then, you know, if you, this is, if you stand in this gate where my friend Walter is looking, he's looking up at the house. And so this is where we're gonna have the post eclipse uh, uh, fiesta, you know, uh, the mezcal is really wonderful and uh, cerveza. And then Mazatlan here, people are celebrating uh, at Easter time, there's a, an event where 10,000 Harley Davidson enthusiasts do, Mex do road trips throughout Mexico and they come on their motorbikes to Mazatlan from all across the country and meet there. So it's really wonderful to hang out with 10,000 Harley Davidson uh, guys and girls, you know, drinking uh, late at night in Mazatlan. I had a, I had a wonderful time uh, there. And so, okay, White Face Mountain, this is the, at the, at us, uh, uh, you get, it says, uh, duration three minutes, 26 seconds, 2,600 miles per hour. That's the, that's White Face Mountain. You can see it in the path of totality. That's my first pick. Um, you know, you go to the Google Earth and find it. And White Face, of course, they realized that they have one of the best places to see it. And this is, uh, they say, um, exclusive cloud splitter gondola for top of the mountain viewing. The most exclusive ticket in town from 2 p.m. to 4.45 p.m., a limited $50 special viewing ticket for foot passengers only will be available for access to Little White Face. The ticket includes a round trip cloud splitter, splitter gondola ride with access to the Little Face deck. S tickets will be on sale online and limited to 125 people. Please, you know, da, da, da. tickets will be on sale Thursday, March 28th at noon. Tickets will only be available online here. So, you know, I can't imagine that that's going to work. You know, I mean, I would think more than 125 people are going to click on that thing, but Anyway, this is what's on their website. Call them up and see if you can get there. I think that would be, and it's clear, I think that would be pretty awesome. Uh, if you go here to Jay Peak, Jay Peak's a great ski resort just outside of Montreal. It's in, uh, it's in, uh, I don't know, it's in Vermont or New Hampshire. It's right, you know, anyway, there it is. Uh, that's the, that's uh, Jay Peak Resort you know, the white out on the path to totality, you know, they're doing something similar. Um, you know, maybe you can try to get access to their gondola. Uh, good luck. You know, Mount Katahdin is on the path of totality uh, in uh, Baxter State Park. It's, um, it would be just incredible. Uh, to be on Mount Katahdin. One of the best hikes I've ever done in my life was on Mount Katahdin. But uh, in early April, there's no access to Katahdin or the mountains around there. It's mud season. It's a very fragile ecosystem. And the, uh, the park is closed to uh, traffic at that time. Um, so what are you going to see at Brandeis if you stay at Brandeis? You're going to see the moon taking bites out of the sun. If you put on these glasses and you look at the moon, then you'll, you're will you not gonna see totality, but you're gonna see, you know, like this, the uh, an hour before the eclipse, you know, 2.30, you're gonna see this little bite. It's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, after uh, 3.30, it's gonna get smaller, you know, smaller and smaller and smaller. You can use something like a pinhole camera to make images of the sun on a screen. So for example, here does, I don't know if you can see it here, people took a, um, a, 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 you know, a serving spoon, you know, with holes in it, draining spoon, and you see these shadows. Uh, you can also just take your fingers like this and cast, and then you get these shadow, you get these images of the moon. Uh, here is just uh, some pine trees and their shadows on the ground. And then you see these crescent moons. And then a couple of the undergraduates who were with me 
in Idaho took a piece of tinfoil and took little pin, uh, took with a pin, made little dots, little holes in the tinfoil and then projected this onto a screen uh, that they had uh, brought with them uh, to these little crescents of the moon. And, um, you know, it's always dangerous to put words into people's mouths. But if, if I was a mind reader, I'm sure this was what Ron was thinking. You know, you know, when I said advice about, you know, cut your classes and head up to the path of totality, you know, but, you know, being the president and it's the board of trustees are coming this day. I don't know who scheduled the board of trustees to come to Brandeis 93% totality on the on the clips. I don't know who was in charge of planning. It wasn't me. Uh, and uh, but he says, if you're going to stay on campus, let's gather together at two third at three twenty p.m. on April eighth. Uh, you know, in Fellows Garden. It's nice for everybody to be together. You can do this projection of the pinhole, you know, onto the screen, and then take silly pictures wearing the glasses and send them to Trent uh, Parker. Oh. It should say Trent Parker, not Trent, right? I got a, what bad, uh, how, did, how did I screw that up? Right, your email is Trent Parker, right? Okay, fix that. That's the correct email uh, to Trent Parker and, you know, or this QR code. Uh, um, okay, one final thing. So uh, the second eclipse I went to was in Iran in 1999 with my family wearing silly eclipse glasses. And I met this young uh, high school student, uh, Ali and his girlfriend, Fari, and he had ground his own telescope, you know, uh, to observe the eclipse. And we stayed in contact. And then here's uh, Ali, and Ferry with our group uh, from Brandeis in uh, 2017. And he uh, and his wife did their PhDs at Brandeis because we met at the eclipse in, uh, in uh, 1999 in uh, Iran. You know, so here we are, uh, 20, <laughs> 1999, a younger me <laughs> and Ali again. <laughs> 2017, uh, also had eclipses, and you know, it's uh, it's uh, it doesn't matter if you see the eclipse or it's cloudy. You're going to meet people. You're going to have experiences. You don't know what's gonna. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. And uh, this on that trip, uh, this is Adam. He was our uh, um, youngest uh, member at two months old. And you can see the, our our slogan for the for the for our eclipses in pursuit of the of the of the path of totality, and so the uh, the 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 probability of seeing eclipse might be low. You know, going up to Vermont, we don't know what the weather forecast is going to be. Uh, it could be low in Mexico. You know, the probability of seeing it is low, but you're guaranteed to have discovery if you open your mind and travel outside of your comfort zone. And uh, so, you know, the Brandeis motto is to uh, explore without boundaries and remember that it's the path you pursue not the destination that matters. And if you have any questions, I'm hoping, happy to address them. Thank you.